This is competition. It's not just a movie. Arnold is not going to let you have it easy. He's very slick and very cunning and very clever. He could be ruthless. Arnold Schwarzenegger is Mr. Universe, a movie star. He's the governor. He wants everything. He doesn't just want to be a movie star. He wants to be the king of the universe. The term larger than life applies inherently to Arnold. There's this aura emanating off the guy. And you feel it when you're around him. One thing I really noticed when I first started working with him. I had done, you know, the high school plays, the local theater. I wanted to do more of that. I went out to a Halloween party and I dressed as Conan. And I had fairly longish hair at that point. I did the full black makeup, those slashes across the face, and a sword. That was like the foreshadow. Suddenly we had this over the top superhuman kind of body that was more and more acceptable and guys who could take off their shirt and look really muscular and cut up and super developed uh, became more and more important in terms of what you saw on screen. You never saw guys like the way we were built in the film business. We would always look down like muscle-bound freak. Arnold changed that. He did Conan the Barbarian. They accepted him more as an actor. I don't think I really had stunts in mind. I, I went to Los Angeles in 1984, sold everything that I owned, got a plane ticket, grabbed an airport bus that said Hollywood on the front. I can still remember this sitting right behind the bus driver. He says, you know where we are? And I'm like, no. And he said, this is Hollywood Boulevard. This is it. Okay, I'll get out here. I didn't know anything about casting, and every morning I would faithfully call all these numbers looking for work. And six or seven months in, and this one company called me back and left a message for me at the Y, and they said, there's this small movie that we are casting called The Terminator. And the director saw your photo. He wants to see you. I walked in, and there was James Cameron. Hey, you're, you're here for the Arnold thing, right? And I said, yep. Yeah. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, stand up. And I stood up, and he checked me out. And then he says, yeah, you'll be fine. You're perfect. And I was like, whoa, I got a job. Whoa, I got a job. All right, all right. My first job in Los Angeles. But before he went back in the office, he stopped, and he said to me, uh, you've done stunts before, right? And I thought, oh, man, what if I say no to this? And so I just said yes. And he goes, good, sign him up. The only person who knew that I didn't have any stunt experience was me. The very first night of shooting, you know, all the lights were on and kind of walking through the lights in my eyes. And then over in the corner was Arnold sitting there smoking a cigar, staring at me, watching me walk towards him. And as I got to about, you know, this close, about 10 feet away, he goes, too tall, no good. Uh, I thought, I'm fired before I've even begun. And then he goes, yeah, you're fine. You're close. Give them to me, now. Three nights later, I found myself driving around shooting a shotgun out of a car window, going, oh, this is awesome. In the scene in the police station, when Arnold first comes in and he douses the lights by reaching into the power box and tearing the 220 line off and kind of arcing it out, Jim said, grab the cable, rip it out with some force and plunge it back into the box. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, well, we're going to set that up now. So, you know, go away and come back in 15, 20 minutes. So I went back into Arnold's trailer and I'm sitting there and he's like, yeah, Peter, what are you doing now? And I said, well, we're doing the cable thing. And he says, oh, yeah, Peter, you should be careful. It's, it's live. It's very dangerous. And I was like, really? Oh, okay. So now I go in to shoot the shot 
and I'm, my hands start shaking as I enter frame. And James Cameron says to me, cut, cut. He goes, Peter, what are you doing? You got to hold it tight. The Terminator has got purpose. He's determined, you know, he's a machine. And I'm like, well, it's live, isn't it? He goes, what? Live? What live? That? And I said, yeah, the, the cable. He goes, of course it's not live. Who told you that? He goes, wait a minute, Arnold told you that. I'm like, yeah, he goes, oh. Yeah, he was laughing. Arnold stays relevant because he played so many iconic characters. And then there's the bodybuilding, the greatest bodybuilder that ever lived. He's redirected himself towards the political arena. Just this big, big energy and focus and drive at anything he does. I went to a party at the Playboy Mansion. And I was sitting there in my pajamas and, you know, looking at all the girls going by. And next to me was Joel Silver. He said, I have a new script you might be interested in. It's called Commando. I said, well, can I read the script? He said, no, if you read the script, you're never going to want to do the movie. So I said, what? He said, yeah, because, you know, the script's just an idea right now. I said, well, who's in it? He says, so Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, we're talking to him, but we don't have him yet. So we went over to Arnold's house. To me, he was already a legend by that point from Terminator. So my heart was beating really fast and I went in there and, you know, we were all like facing him and we were all like, we must do the movie because we had a deal if he said yes. The writer pitched the story and acted it out and we were very nervous, is he gonna like this or not? He says, I'm not a Conan the Barbarian. I'm not a robot. I can be like a real person here. He was saving his daughter. So he loved all those aspects that he could be human and actually have an actual acting part. We were trying to find someone to act opposite Arnold. Sharon Stone, Bridget Nelson. There was many, many girls that came in and they all read and it was all coming across quite flat. I was able to book an audition for this weird little movie called Commando that was written for a white woman, blonde, to be with this guy, Schwarzenegger. I had on a very short skirt, and I introduced myself to Schwarzenegger, and I said, I love you. I met you when I was nine years old. That's what I said. My dad, he's a big bodybuilder, so he would take my sister and I to Muscle Beach. And he would go pump iron with Arnold and all the 70s big guys. And we would play on in the playground all day. And that's how I first met Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was nine. And he was very sweet and gorgeous and, you know, delicious Arnold. But I'm sure he didn't remember me. I was just a kid. But he did remember my dad. And that helped. Now, the trick about Commando was that um, there was a part in the script where there was a dildo that the stewardess pulls out of her bag and she owns, you know, she says, oh, it gets lonely on the road, it was some crap line. And I remember reading the script thinking before the audition, all the actresses are choking on this. They're, it's not working, right? Because it's not funny. So I took that moment, I knew exactly what I was gonna do. When it came to that scene, he pulls it out. I said, that must be yours, because it's not mine. So here's Schwarzenegger with this <laughs> pretend imaginary dildo in his hand in a room, and the whole room burst into laughter. And he didn't know what to do. He's like, oh, uh, 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 and it was perfect. So needless to say, that got cut out of the script, but I got the part. Don't break radio silence until they see me. How will I know? Because all hell is going to break loose. There was like a chemistry. Be careful, Matrix. Good luck. Thanks. For Commando, I was viewing the movie as this giant pop art movie. I knew that it was going to be fun. Arnold, he played it perfectly. What's amazing about Arnold was his work ethic and how perfectionist he was about everything. I viewed Arnold as this superhuman muscle man bodybuilder. I didn't differentiate between like real life and what he actually could do. I envisioned him as a superhero. We got to this big scene where he holds Sully over the cliff. 
You're a funny guy, Sally. I like you. That's why I'm going to kill you last. The night before shooting, I just wanted to confirm with Arnold. So I called him up and I said, Arnold, tomorrow's scene, you're going to pull Sully from the car and you walk across the highway with him and you hold him over the cliff face down. So you're holding his legs and then you're going to drop him. Okay, that's the shooting like tomorrow night. What is important is gravity. He says, what's going to be holding him up? I go, well, you are. He weighs 135 pounds. That should be nothing for you. I think you're where I'm supposed to meet him. But you won't. And he goes, I can't walk across the highway carrying a man by his legs and then play a whole scene while I'm holding him over a cliff. I can't do that. Are you crazy? And I go, oh my God, but you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. That can't be. I have to remind you, Sally, <laughs> this is my week off. I'm panicked, so. Like I'm calling the studio, all the people, I go, what do we do? We can't like do this scene. <laughs> fade out, fade in the next night, a giant crane shows up, like a huge crane. And the actor had to be like in a, you know, wires and a, in a harness. You can't kill me, Matrix. You need me to find your daughter. Where is she? That scene went on for hours to film and why I thought he could, somebody could hold somebody like that for hours. But that's what I thought of Arnold. Oh. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's right, Major. You did. I lied. What'd you do with Sally? I let him go. I thought that this guy could do anything. He was like Mr. Universe. Well, Arnold, I read about him in the magazine since I was a little kid. He always had this arrogant attitude. At the age of about three or four, I remember my mother and father, they clapped their hands and they wouldn't respond. They had my hearing diagnosed and they provided me with an old-fashioned hearing aid. Kids would call me deaf new, deaf Louis. I was very insecure, introverted. I used to buy a lot of comic books and trade comic books. That was my escape. I was obsessed with power. One time I saw it on the shelf, a cover that said Dave Drake was on the cover, a shot of him doing a chest pose. I said to myself, oh my God, this is a bodybuilder. I mean, I'd never seen a man with muscles before. I flexed in the mirror, I was too skinny. I discovered the whole world of bodybuilding and I knew that there was a path for me because I wanted to work out with weights. That was the end of the comic books and that was all the muscle magazine. That was my whole world. Every year they had the contest called the Miss Olympia at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I remember Arnold competing. I begged my father to take me. My father being a police officer, we happened to get them past it to get in early. I'll never forget, I was downstairs, I walked in the back, I had the glasses on, I was a skinny kid, very quiet, and I'm watching all these guys popping up. Then I see Arnold. It's like it's my idol. And I just stared at him because when he took his shirt off, everything just exploded. Everybody else walked by him, and he stands down by himself. I've never seen a guy so enormous, his arm huge. And I said, I said, wow. I wanted to train in Gold Gym and be part of the mega of bodybuilder. Joe Gold, who opened Gold's in 65, opened it for his friends on the beach. It wasn't a well-known gym, just the fact that it's Venice Beach, Muscle Beach. The front door was open and the back door was open and the breeze would just come through. It's very small, you could smell the ocean. It was the beach crowd. And when I walked in, first person I ran into face to face is Arnold Schwarzenegger. This guy's huge, weighed like 260. Big chest, big arms. He says, what are you working today? I said, I'm probably gonna do some benches, some chest, this and that. He says, let's work together. He was strong, but I was always stronger in the bench press. My best was 455, his was like 440. So it gave him an inspiration, but we got along really well. We would see if we could keep up with each other. Of course, there was a little competition. And he'd flex his bicep, Rick, Rick, check this out, check this bicep. And I look at him, my like, God, it's huge. He had magnificent arms, his chest was like big slabs of meat. Big back, small waist, flat stomach. He had it all. He says, a German and a Jew training together. And I said, yeah, it's a little different, isn't it? Arnold had a very strong personality. He uh, was very focused. He can learn anything. 
and he's logical and he figures things out real quick. Once you come to the United States and you walk into Venice and the Golds and you see who's around, you see Joe Weider with the biggest magazine in the world that can put you over the top worldwide. And I think he saw that and said, if I get this magazine, I get the covers of these magazines and I win these shows, there's no limit to what I can do. I think Arnold's focus and discipline functions at multiple levels. Through bodybuilding, I think he developed such an enormous focus on discipline to do exactly what he felt he needed to do to get out of Austria, to get into Germany, to get to America, to become the greatest bodybuilder in the world. If you want fame, you're going to have to have discipline. He does seduce people by his enormous personality, the force of his smile, teasing you, making a joke with you. In my case, he just did kind of suck me in. We would go out and everybody would stare at Arnold. Women, maybe gay men, but mostly women coming in, touching the biceps. Oh, can I have a picture with you, please? Oh my God, oh my God, these muscles, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Please, huh, please, hug. They were just aggressive. I mean, isn't that tacky? How could you do that to him in front of me? And of course, that meant that I didn't exist. So I had a lot of competition for his attention. It was tough, and we definitely had arguments about it. Arnold invited me to go to New York with him for a Mr. Olympia contest. You know, it's a world. Muscles, shaved hair, oiling up, bumping up. I would talk to Arnold about how he would mess with competitors' heads. Winning came at all costs. He wanted to wipe them out. He wanted to psych them out. And he would call it just teasing. But, you know, I was not keen on watching his, how he treated his competitors. But he felt that that gave him a competitive edge. And it's like, ooh, this is like a little much. I don't need, think I need to be doing all these contests for the rest of my life. But there you go on stage. That was our world. And I sort of lost myself because I am an appendage in that world. And so sometimes that would strike me like, what's my identity here? At the end of the competition, a friend came and grabbed me from the audience and I was escorted me backstage. And all of a sudden, I'm back there hearing the announcer saying, and the future Mrs. Arnold Schwarzenegger will present the trophy to the next Mr. Olympia. And I went and presented it to him. And there, it's like, Arnold, see? The world knows we will marry. Every January 1st, Arnold would make an index card and he would list five goals. He was intensely interested in politics. He'd grown up in Austria, seeing that the government had been on their backs. And so he absolutely believed that the government should be as small as possible and just get off my back. Let me have my life. Year two or three after we had broken up, he'd invited me to lunch in Venice. And we sat at the table and he goes, you just wait. In 10 years, I will be the governor of California. I was approached by George Butler and Charles Gain. They were making this film called Pumping Iron. It's like, get them talking. It's the first time that bodybuilders would go in the mainstream. I was 23 at the time. Why not have a chance to be in this film? And you know, him being my idol, I wanted to beat him. At the time, I think it was like 27, 28, and he had maturity, had years of training. But I just knew I just had to raise the bar myself to, to be able to compete with him. It was hard because training back then, the 75 Miss Olympia. I had this small gym, so I was training all by myself. How do you feel, Lou? You know, my father wanted to be in the film. Before, afterwards, he never trained with me. They thought it'd be nice to play the father-son role. That's it. Atta boy. It was like a love-hate relationship. And I was re re rejected when I was born because I was not the perfect son. 
I did the best I could. And it was kind of hard because he expected me to go there and he wanted me to win. You know, he kept saying, we're going to beat that German, we're going to beat that German. You gotta win, you gotta win. All bodybuilders had a weak relationship with the father. They are suffering. Arnold had really not had a healthy, happy childhood. Older father returned from the war, drinker, rough, self-centered man as a father. A bodybuilder wants attention. I will develop my calves, my quads, my obliques, my biceps, my deltoids. Then my father will notice me. The bravado, the sarcasm, the flippancy, the sense of humor was like, I'm so confident you can't penetrate me. I will, I will mix him up. <laughs> he will come so ready to South Africa, so strong. But by the time the night is over, the next morning, he will be ready to lose. Hey, Lo, is this a master plan here this morning? <laughs> right. Huh? I hope back in that, uh, like my father, Arnold, they were playing mind games. You could see at the time, I was kind of shy, but both of them were going at each other. You're the king of kings, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my father can be very amusing, and then he was like uh, attacking Arnold with different strategy. You guys are sacking me out here early in the morning. Easy. Huh? They don't come nicer than you, Arnold. I'm a nice guy. I wouldn't turn my back on you, Arnold, within <laughs> 500 yards. <laughs> But you never know what's coming out of either one's mouth. When it comes to a contest, he'll do anything he can to win. Calm him down. Help him. Day of the contest, I did have a lot of pressure. You have other bodybuilders there. Also, you can smell the baby oil. You can hear the cameras blowing. You hear the tension. You hear the breathing. And the room's pretty small. What do you think your chances are today? I'm going to lose all You're the best. Thank you. It's almost like you just want to get out of there, but just in there. I had thoughts of taking the box and throwing on him, <laughs> maybe uh, break a leg or something so you won't compete. And he goes, I'm watching you, and I said, I'm watching you too. You know, when you're in that competition, the best guy you want to win is fierce. I'm just watching him like a fox. He's very slick, and uh, he's very cunning, and very clever. He could be ruthless. So you could hear the roar of the audience before you walk up the stairway when you step out. All the judges love both of us. They call for like a show double arm post, like a chest post, back post, and then most muscular. Then they say what you call the pose down. It's the first time you see two guys over six feet tall competing. Two giants. Two, two bigger giants in the sport. Two warriors fighting for the death. You will see him throwing the most muscular, then I throw the most muscular. Then you do a twisting back, I do a twisting back because I've studied all his poses to match him every pose I can to compete with him. Almost like boxing match without, without fighting like the showdown. That's what made Pumping Iron stand out. That specific part of the film, that was like the climax, like boom, like an explosion. Third place from the United States of America, Lou Ferrigno. Inside of me at the time, I felt like a shame because I knew I could have done better. On one, and then you see uh, the looks of the camera, the smile, and everything, and then. One and only, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, it, it was a tough one. After the competition, my father he said to me, "When you go home, he said, I want you out of my house. So you're a loser." And I was devastated because I'm saying to myself, "I'm all the way in South Africa." And my father's saying to, to me, "I don't deserve this." He wanted more than anything for me to win so he could share that glory. So it was tough. It was, a t it was one of the toughest days of my life. Devastating. I never told anyone this before. 
And to me, it wasn't really everything about winning. To be going down there, continue my life as a champion and be part of this great sport. Bodybuilding has been a beautiful experience for me and I will continue it for the rest of my life. I only stopped competing, but I'm not stopping bodybuilding. It's the greatest sport. Thank you. Arnold announced his retirement. And I didn't want to compete anymore because my ambition, my goal was to defeat him. When you think about pumping iron today, it's not about who won the competition. It was about who stood out. I didn't realize they showed pictures of me growing up as a kid. You know, I see the hearing aid, you see all the, the personal side of me. But little did I realize that everyone embraced it. It opened a lot of doors for me. I ended up filming the Hulk TV series, so that changed my life. I always wanted to be like the Hulk, and now I have the chance to play the Hulk. Isn't that amazing? But it all came after pumping iron because of exposure. It put both of us on the map. Arnold calls me, he says, I have an audition in Burbank for a gladiator film. Come on, maybe there'll be something for you. Yeah, I don't want to be a gladiator, but I'll go with you. And so we went to this house where they were auditioning, and there was two guys sitting there with the scripts, and he come in and sit down, and he gave him a script, he says, take a look at it, and then read the first two pages for me. And there's those biblical lines that no one can read. I mean, I can't read them. So Arnold went through the pages stumbling and laughing and kidding and joking, and I didn't know what that word is and this word is, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, brother. So they said, okay, thank you very much. We get in the car, and he says, so what do you think? I said, Arnold, forget acting. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Yeah. Stick around. Working with Arnold, for me, man, there was no way I was going to let Arnold look better than me. <laughs> okay, I just wasn't going to do it. We've got a transponder fix on their position. About here. What do you need us for? Because some damn fool accused you of being the best. Dylan! You son of a bitch. A man shake is what I call it. I didn't want to be put in a position where people are looking at Arnold Schwarzenegger instead of looking at Carl Weathers. What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils? I mean, I already know I'm at a disadvantage. He's Mr. Universe, right? Huh? If I'm not looking like I can compete with him, then it doesn't work. Had enough? Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. I remembered something that that a, a buddy I'd worked with once many, many years before that said, to buy a shirt two sizes too small. So I cut the sleeve off and rolled it up. So it's super tight now. So that when I put my arm up there, the shirt is bulging, right? This is competition. It's not just a movie. This is competition. So you better do whatever you have to do and can do to hang in there. Because uh, Arnold is not going to let you have it easy. When you face people who are really at the top of their game, you're going to be able to stand up and hold your own. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. I did know when to quit, huh? Damn good to see you, Dutch. Never make Mr. Universe, that I know. But hey, in film, I can hold my own. What is this? Thai business. Oh, come on. Forget about my Thai man. The man shake. I'm reminded of that constantly by people, you know, and the question is always, who won that? Did you let Arnold win? Of course I let him win. It was in the script. Look, we're in the jungle shooting a movie. This guy's got big stogies in their mouth, sitting in their chair, waiting for their shot. Arnold was the cigar smoker, you know, and <laughs> it, it was just a part of the deal. Throw on top of it these giant personalities. We got the time off, everybody's down on the beach having a good time. Cigars and tequila and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. I was talking to this woman and Arnold, of course, in Arnold's style, you know, just wants to come in and mess with me. Arnold gets up and walks over to me and says, Kylie, your wife is on the phone. The children need to talk to you. No, I wasn't married, didn't I? My kids, you know. 
that's Arnold. You know, guy who can get inside your head, screw with you at the moment, throw you off your game, and laugh about it. You can't win this, Dylan. Maybe I can get even. It's always one-upmanship. Dylan. It's always competitive in nature. And if he can't necessarily get you by flexing, he's going to try to get you mentally. That's just the way he operates. He's not going to let you have one up. It's just not going to happen, you know. I think this is what you're looking for. You sell some! So f all of it. There was nothing that was thrown at us that he couldn't have handled physically. The guy was in damn good shape. I know you're Mr. Universe, but come on, man. You're lifting the damn truck. No, wait a minute now. This is a damn truck. But what are you gonna do, okay? You just let it go, right? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was with my family in the Aspen Snowmass area. I was coming into the building just as he was leaving. And he stopped for a second. He looked at me in that way that Arnold can look at you. And he said, you're that Ghostbuster guy, right? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, you know, I could be a Ghostbuster. That was his first line to me. I had not been thinking about making a film with him. I didn't think of him as an actor, really, but there was something about the confidence and there was something kind of unusual about him. On a kind of real personal basis, he had a wonderful sense of humor. And that maybe there was a way to use that in the right role. Coincidentally, I was up at the Toronto Film Festival and Danny DeVito was there. And there was something about the proximity of the meetings. I started thinking about somehow pairing them. And that really was the gestation for twins. We were together, I was directing and producing our script. Really, it was our movie, it wasn't the studio's movie. My idea with Arnold and Dan was that none of us would get paid, that we would work for whatever the guild minimum was, was for each of us, and that we would make a kind of profit-sharing deal for ourselves with the studio made us partners, both financially and creatively, right away. We wrote it down on a cocktail napkin, which the three of us signed. What we didn't know is, well, can he really act? Can he actually speak the English language in a naturalistic way? It's like he practiced acting too much. He would look in a mirror and he would do these things with his, you know, with his eyebrows and his forehead and with his chin, and I said, it's different than posing. You're, you have to be more fluid and honest. Just forget all that stuff. It was about unlearning. In the first scene that we filmed on Twins, Arnold comes to bail out DeVito in jail. And DeVito doesn't even know why Arnold is there. I'm your long lost brother, and DeVito's very, very long sort of kind of quiet take to that kind of ridiculous news is very, very funny, and it's sort of the key to the comedy of the whole movie. Who are you? I'm Vincent's brother. We're twins. As soon as I was able to make him relax and, and work with people and just have conversation. Come on. Suddenly, this magical guy that you you got to know as a real person suddenly would fly out, and he, in fact, became very effective as a comedic actor. Even though Arnold had bigger movies, he made actually more money off of Twins. When your main actor is really helping the director and the crew and is the first one on the set and is really gung-ho, everybody falls in line. There's no, there's no bad behavior, and, you know, he was very dedicated. This amazing confidence that he used in every aspect of his life. Arnold Schwarzenegger is completely confident in Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's like the poster person for I'm going to rule the world. I was not that confident when I was a 15-year-old kid. I was rather shy. 
you know. But I think each victory and each thing that I accomplished made me realize that yes, I am good and I'm getting better and I'm getting smarter and all those things. He's supremely ambitious. I mean, everything that he does and has achieved, he pre-thought out. I'm sure out of the sea of women he had a choice of, I can imagine that he said, I want to marry not only the most beautiful woman, but the most powerful woman. So you've got a woman who's gorgeous and happens to be, you know, a very leading, bright, strong news person. And she's right in the inner circle of Washington, Maria Shriver. He married into the Kennedy family. And you can't be in the inner circle of the Kennedys and not be political. And he told me back then even that they would have a lot of discussions at Hyannisport with the Kennedys. And he was a conservative Republican or, you know, not on social issues, but he was basically a conservative Republican. And so he joined into this political family. I think he knew that she would be someone that would help him. And he'd be, be entering into this like rarefied, you know, class of people in this ruling elite. And he was, he was Schwarzenegger. You know, the idea of politics was always one of the more important conversations we had. Not so much would Arnold go into politics, why he shouldn't go into politics. And Maria always counseled against it. You've got all the money in the world. You are the biggest movie star. What's left to conquer? Politics. And if you really understand power, it's not in Hollywood. People were focused on politics in those days because uh, they were feeling the pain of some very bad policies. The economy was in the tank, our credit rating was shot. People realized we drifted far off course. That was the state of California in 2003. Down with Gray Davis. This is a governor under siege. If the people want uh, uh, me to present my credentials again, I do not fear them. With more than a million signatures collected by his opponents, he's now all but certain to become the first governor in California history to face a recall election. Well, a recall election is basically a do-over. It was the first time in the history of California that a governor had actually been successfully recalled. While I've made mistakes, while we have a tough economy all across the country, at the end of the day, I believe they will acknowledge we have been making progress. Nobody knew exactly what Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to do. I would have been surprised either way. The wild card in California politics now is actor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has strongly hinted he will run as a Republican in a recall election. No announcements to make if that's your question. And no announcements to make. Arnold Schwarzenegger surprised just about everyone and decided he would make the race for California governor. The supporters are already calling him the political terminator. Good morning. Good morning. You know who I am, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Make sure if you can pronounce my name. Schwarzenegger. Very good. <laughs> that an Austrian farm boy can come over to America and get into the movie business. They said, we cannot pronounce your name, you cannot speak English well, and your body is overdeveloped. And you know what happened? I became the highest paid entertainer in the world. And it's part of my agenda to reform Sacramento, to reform the whole system. Whenever you have a candidate who is known only by his first name, you know you're facing a formidable challenger. And of course, had an enormous amount of money to bring to the race and had the entire Republican Party establishment behind it as well. This afternoon, the rich Republican congressman who bankrolled the recall in the first place, Daryl Issa, tearfully withdrew from the race, saying Schwarzenegger's entry shows there are enough qualified candidates in the recall. I have a very clear vision. I feel very passionate about California, and it feels so good about going in there and cleaning house once and for all. He had a broom that he brought to his appearances. He was going to sweep Sacramento clean. With any untested candidate, there's always the chance that they might self-destruct. That chance was always there with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I cannot be paid off and uh, bought. I've never lost money on any of the business deals. I mean, I am a very astute businessman. He had a great deal of experience in bodybuilding, a great deal of experience in movie making, no experience in governance, and this was a critical moment for the governance of California. 
He brought to the debate a very good sense of humor, which he used very effectively. I uh, just realized that I have a perfect part for you in Terminator 4. Everybody was just expecting me to attack him, and I wasn't there to attack him. I was focused on the issues. I steer a straight course, and I stay that course no matter what the pressure. The Republican Party establishment was constantly after me to drop out of the race. They'd gotten all of the other major Republicans to drop out. So few Republicans in California, you're going to split the vote and guarantee another Democrat gets elected. The pressure was quite intense. He had the party establishment, I had the party base. So it was pretty much a standoff. I set always big goals for myself, and most of them accomplished, but this one, is a little bit bigger than I am. And that's why I need your help. I want you to vote for me on October 7th. And that's what happened. I want to reach out to everybody, the young and old, rich and poor, people of all religions, all colors, and all nationalities. I want to be the governor for the people. I want to represent everybody. I think the key to Arnold Schwarzenegger is he loves to be loved. And that's a very helpful thing when you're out there in the public eye performing. Uh, it's a very dangerous thing if you're a leader in a crisis. My seven years as governor were the most fulfilling years that I've ever had in my life. I did not accomplish everything that was on my to-do list, but I don't think any governor ever does. It's very rare that somebody gets to the top of three different highly competitive fields of bodybuilding, movie making, and politics. There's no question he got to the top of all three. If he could be president, he would have been president. But the fact is he couldn't by law. I can't imagine another guy coming along that could do all of what Arnold's managed to do in such a short life. It's just, uh, it's just inconceivable in many ways. The youth and the older guys still look up to Arnold as the number one body in the world. No one compares to what he had, which got him into acting, which also got him into politics, and the brains came with it. Life is a delicious game for Arnold, and he lives it well. And now, He's back in the film industry, and he's making video games, and he's encouraging people to work out again with a new program. It just never ends for him. Even now, when I go to Go Gym in the morning, seven, eight, we're different. 2007, nine, yeah. 10, 2, 1, 11, yes. Ah! I've had conversations with him that both of us have similar fathers, driven, driven. We're not perfect enough. Seven. When you get older, you know, everything changes. You have maturity. We show more and more support for our children. We don't want to be the father that we've had. And it was all about the strong and imposing and, and heroic figure. Nothing phases him. He was 100% dedicated to whatever task he picked up. And I'm quite sure he's still that way to this day. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. Get I'll be back. <laughs> There's nothing stopping him. Yeah, you can't understand him, but who cares about understanding people? It's less about words. It's more about badass power. Hasta la vista. There was a funny moment when we were doing Commando, and we were sitting at a roadside cafe eating ice cream. And this lady came up to me, and she said, Arnold, can I please have your autograph? And then Arnold chimes in, in his voice, and says, yeah, Arnold, be nice and give the lady an autograph. And so I just grabbed a napkin and a pen and scrawled Arnold's name. I forged his signature and handed it to her, and she went off with it. And we all just looked at each other and busted up laughing. 